I did a study a few years ago in the book of Hebrews where I walked through verse by verse like we're doing the book of John. Um, at the time, we were pastoring a church in, in Missouri, and I did that every Wednesday night when I was in town. There was travel weeks and things, and it took us over a year to get through Hebrews. I look back now and think that was an amazing speed, that it only took me over a year to get through Hebrews, seeing as I'm moving very slow on this one. But the comment I was making to Kyle was that I had never journeyed through a book. I've journeyed through, I guess, every book of the New Testament at some point in my radio, television, podcast, or pastoral career. Um, I had never went through one that did to me what Hebrews did to me. It established my heart in grace. I had a head full of grace. Hebrews established my heart in grace. And then we started John in this group. And I'm having a very similar experience with John. Similar in that I'm finding things happening in me spiritually, mentally, emotionally, that haven't happened in a lot of other studies. Dissimilar in that Hebrews established my heart in grace. John, I have yet to really pin down what it's doing to me. I'll keep you updated. But there are some things happening in my understanding of the Holy Spirit. There are some things happening in my understanding of Christ in his incarnation, what he was doing on the earth and what that might have looked like. But I think most importantly, what role I play, and you can personalize that for you, I hope, as we go along, what role I play in the great exploration of the new creation that is the kingdom of God. And by watching Jesus, and particularly, because we could get this in Matthew or Mark or Luke, but we're not in Matthew, Mark, or Luke. We're in John. And there's something very special and powerful about being in John. Not just that he's non-synoptic, non-similar to the other Gospels, but that John is doing something to me as a reader and as a teacher. Uh, he is trying to convince me. He tells us that at the end of his book. I, he's an agenda writer. I write these things so that by believing on him, you may have life in his name and it's working. <laughs> I'm reading it and it is working. I'm finding life in seeing this man's life particularly through the lens of John the, the writer because John is doing something and we're going to dig in tonight and, and find out a little more about that. And we do it tonight in the most, probably the most famous two words in the new covenant and that's born again. I say famous and it, it might surprise you and as we go tonight I'll bring this out a little better I hope but I say famous and yet it is not as much the theme of the New Testament as you might believe those two words born again. It's the undercurrent of Paul's theology but he never actually uses the phrase. Paul never says born again. The New Testament doesn't talk about it a lot. I don't want to put the cart ahead of the horse in that statement because we'll get there. But this is a particularly impressive moment in the ministry of Jesus with Nicodemus, a man that does not appear in any other New Testament account. He only appears in the book of John. And that, as we said last week, three times in John's gospel, Nicodemus resurfaces. You see this progression of Nicodemus as we go along. The fact that the other Gospels don't give you Nicodemus, I don't want to overplay that hand. I don't want to overplay that fact. Maybe they just don't because Matthew didn't know about it, or maybe Mark had not heard of it, or maybe Luke just thought there were other stories you needed. I mean, nobody else gives you the prodigal son, and that doesn't mean it wasn't a powerful story or that it wasn't an important moment. Only Luke gives you that. But maybe, just maybe, tonight is one of our first introductions to John working off of Paul. That's something I told you 15 weeks ago was going to happen. That as you progress into John, a book that I think is written after the fall of the temple in AD 70, after Judaism has lost its temple sacrificial system, has lost its priesthood, has lost its genealogical history, and now staring down the barrel at a new century, we're over, maybe we're 50 years, 60 years from the ascension of Christ when John writes this letter, and he's writing it on the other side, 
of the fall of the Mosaic economy, and he's introducing themes that are so Pauline that there's times you'd swear only Paul could have wrote this gospel. And that's impossible. And so I think John's building off of the Christianity that he's introduced to. And I know that sounds odd because John is in his own book. He's there, but he's building off of Paul's version of what Paul understood to be the gospel. And we'll dig into that. And I'm excited about that journey tonight. But let's read first. John chapter 3 and verse number 1. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. Being a ruler of the Jews would make him a member of the Sanhedrin. There's an indication deeper in this, and we brought this out last week, that he might be the chief teacher of the Sanhedrin. This man came to Jesus by night, and that was our title last week, by the way, Nicodemus by night, and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher. Come from God. Keep that word we just kind of floating around in the back of your head for a moment. Maybe just file it away. That's probably safer. We know that you're a teacher come from God, for no one can do these things that you do unless God is with him. And Jesus answered. This is interesting because Nicodemus didn't ask a question. So most of the time, if you see an answer, you've seen a preceding question. Nicodemus didn't ask anything. And yet Jesus answers. So the question is not verbalized. The question's in his heart. This is one of our indicators of Jesus through the lens of the Spirit seeing more than meets the eye. He's a, it's an understatement to say he's good at that. <laughs> Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Here's a consideration for you as we begin tonight. I want you to consider that Israel has derived all of her confidence in the time of Christ in natural birth. If you're a Jew in the time of Christ, your confidence in your standing is not power militarily. You have none. It's not land. You own none. It's not influence in the world. You have none. Caesar rules the world. Rome is the empire that covers the known globe. The footprint of Alexander the Great is still on the planet. It's the reading and the writing language of the world, not Hebrew. You really have no basic influence anywhere. And yet the Jew still walks with his head held high in the days of Christ for one reason. And that is because he takes his identity and his pride in natural birth. He believes that he's been born into a special family. He believes his people are chosen of God. He believes he can stretch that knowledge back to at least Abraham. He believes it is in his DNA to consider himself one of the sons of God. Please keep that in mind. A Jew in, in the day of Jesus would have believed it was in his DNA to call himself one of the sons of God. He was born of man, born of a circumcision. I know this is going to sound like I'm taking it too far, but this is building off of Old Testament tradition for a moment, okay? He's born of a circumcised man. <laughs> Big deal, right? Big deal, because that circumcised man is only circumcised because that cutting was his sign that he is connected to his father. And through, and this is a little crude, but through that circumcision comes the next generation. And so you're then born with this pride. It's not nationalism, but you're born with this bloodline pride of who you are. This surfaces over and over again throughout the Old Testament, but John does it himself. Look at John chapter 8. I'm going to give you three, three little passages here in John 8. And these are, I, I, I want to admit to you, I don't have time to contextually teach John 8 because. John 8 is a treasure trove that when we get to it, it's probably a five-weeker all by itself. But So please ignore or forgive the fact that we don't do a lot of context here. Every one of these three verses I'm going to give you are other people talking to Jesus and their Jewish leaders, namely Pharisees, maybe members of the Sanhedrin. This is how they feel about themselves. They answer Jesus, we are Abraham's descendants. We've never been in bondage to anyone. How can you say you will be made free? Notice their argument. Their argument is, we belong to Abraham. We're not in bondage to anybody. They forgot about Egypt, by the way. It's convenient dropping off of memory when you're in an argument. How many of us have done that? Conveniently forgetting information that would undermine our argument. But their argument is not dealing with Egypt. But we've never been in bondage to anybody. Jesus could have said, you know, what about Pharaoh? But he doesn't. How can you say you'll be made free? Look at the next one. That was 33. Here's 39. They answered and said to him, again, I know we're skipping verses. We're doing this just to establish a thought, okay? 
They answered and said to him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said, if you were Abraham's children, then you would do the works of Abraham. Jesus has admitted to them, I know you are Abraham's descendants, but you are not Abraham's children or you'd be doing the works of Abraham. But notice what's their bragging point. Not we're moral people, not we keep the law, not we go to synagogue, not we know we've all, we're all circumcised. Their bragging point is we're Abraham's kids. Something belongs to us because it belonged to Abraham. One more. This is 41, two verses later. Jesus says, you do the deeds of your father. And they said to him, we were not born of fornication. We have one father, God, and that, and we'll deal with that in detail when we get there. That could be a stone they're throwing at Jesus. We are not the product of fornication. It's quite possible that in the life and ministry of Jesus, he dealt with the argument that his mother and father were not married when she was, when she was found to be pregnant. And so he might, that might trail him through much of his earthly ministry. And that could be a stab at his past. We're not products of fornication. Whether or not that's the case, it definitely fits the motif of the other two verses, which is, hey, we know who we are because we can trace it all the way back to Abraham. You've heard me say, and I will say this again next week when we dip into the kingdom of God passages, but you've heard me say before that the transition from an old age to a new age, an old covenant to a new covenant, a lot of which rotates around the temple actually coming down in AD 70 because that temple was a representation of heaven on earth to the Jewish family. Um, one of the features of the temple falling was not just that they didn't have priests anymore and they couldn't sacrifice lambs anymore. One of the features was the Romans burned all the records. Now, that doesn't seem like much. I mean, if you burn your records, you surely got backups, right? <laughs> That's a really good joke. Um, <laughs> not in AD 70, you don't. So if, you're, if your genealogical records are gone, they're gone. And so you've been able to trace your lineage all the way back to Abraham. And once the Romans burned the temple, you couldn't do that anymore. One of the greatest sources of... Abrahamic descendant pride was burned beneath the torches of the Roman soldiers. And so that was another cutoff from the Mosaic into the new, into the, and forgive this language, but into the new age. I have to say forgive that in front of Christians because you say new age to most Christians. You, oh, Lord. You know, I knew this guy. I was waiting on the other shoe to drop, and there it was, the new age. But when you move into a new age, that might be safer, a new age, you had to eliminate the old. I'm getting a little bogged down on that. So for sake of getting back to our text, let's go to John 3, 3, because I want to take you right back to where we, almost where we started. Really, it's the last verse we read. Jesus answered and said to him, most surely I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. I, I want to slow down for a moment and try to deal with how we shape this verse in modern Christianity because this is a key verse. If I mean, we've had good stuff in John 1 and John 2 and we've had such good stuff it took us 13 weeks to get out of the first two chapters and, and, and then the last week to transition into the third one. So I don't want to undersell those first two chapters but you know as well as I do the real meat of your Christian theology starts right here in John 3.3. 3. All right. I mean, you'd be okay as a Christian if you didn't know anything about the water being turned to wine. You'd be okay as a Christian if you didn't understand the theology of in the beginning was the word and the word was. If you didn't know squat about logos, you'd make it. But if you didn't know about born again, most of us wouldn't have much of an idea what being a Christian means. Because for most of our lives, those were two, those were one and the same. So I'm a Christian. What that mean? I was born again. In fact, when someone says I'm a, I'm a Christian, we'll go, when, when did you get born again? Or better grammar, when were you born again? And so what we focus on then is an experienced Christianity. And for most of us, experiential Christianity was, hey, I'm at the end of my sermon. How many of you, heads bowed, eyes closed, how many of you would like to accept Jesus? Raise your hand. And then that we did, or we went forward, or we signed a card, or we sat through a counseling class. We probably repeated a sinner's prayer. Someone walked us through the Romans road. I don't know. I'm smattering here, but I've, I've been in it long enough that I've seen all of that stuff be the, the born-again experience. So much so that most of us have sort of cataloged the born-again experience as the ticket to heaven. I want you to look at that verse, John 3, 3. Look at how it's worded. The particulars of, we don't worry too much yet about the, the answer. We'll get into that. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. But here's how we saw it. Most of us saw this verse this way. Unless you have a born again experience, you won't go to heaven when you die. 
That's most of our recap of John 3.3. 3. If I were to ask you, hey, does the Bible say unless you have born again experience, you don't go to heaven when you die? You go, yep, Jesus said unless man's born again. Won't. I don't know if we just trail off after that. He won't see the kingdom or we just think the kingdom and heaven are the same thing. So it's just, we kind of, and I've done that. I did that with verses for a long time in my life. I, I had them up here and then they'd come out here and between here and here, stuff gets lost. And I just assume that the gaps were stuff, they said things I didn't think they said, or I thought they said. For instance, unless a man has a born-again experience, he won't go to heaven when he dies. That's how most of us look at John chapter 3, verse 3. But I want you to take time out for a moment. I want you to remember how I asked you to set this context up, and that was this. If you're a Jew living in the time of Christ, the one bragworthy thing that you have is that you can trace your lineage all the way back to Abraham. In other words, what you boast about is who you were born into your bloodline, your family. So I want to declare to you that perhaps Jesus' declaration that a man must be born again doesn't have near as much to do with your experience as it did with Jesus speaking to a Jew. The way the kingdom of God's going to happen has nothing to do with how you were originally born. And for my audience, let's be, I'm speaking as Jesus for a moment, for my audience, We've all, all of our lives thought it had to do with how we were originally born, who we were originally born to. John 3, 2. Let's ease into it for a moment. <laughs> this man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know you're a teacher come from God. Nobody can do the things you do unless God's with him. Jesus answered. Why does Jesus answer when there is no question? Well, there's obviously a question in Nicodemus's heart. Otherwise, why bother? What's the meeting by night mean if not to have some problems solved? Jesus understands sort of the semantics of what's going on, even if it hasn't been articulated. But Nicodemus claims that he has the ability to spot a good man. In fact, he has the ability to spot a man who is come from God. He can identify what comes from God. And yet Jesus counters that argument. Why? Nicodemus says, I know that you're a good man. Actually, we know that you're a good man. There's that we hanging out there. We know that you're a good man come from God. Nobody could do what you do unless he was come from God. And Jesus says, I say to you, unless a man's born again, he's not going to see the kingdom of God. See, Nicodemus, you have learned to frame things around a certain way. You know how to spot something. You know how to identify something, but they're there comes a new kind of birth rather than the same old kind of birth. There's something that is going to happen in the meeting of Jesus. Jesus says this to Nicodemus. There's something that's going to happen that will usher you into a new kingdom that is in no way like what you have come out of. You have a whole way of doing things, but there's a whole new way of doing things. Don't read into this our own born-again experience. That might be there. We'll get to that. Well, I think it is there. But it's not what Nicodemus hears because it's not what Nicodemus needs to hear. He doesn't need to hear walk the aisle, kneel down, say a sinner's prayer. Nicodemus believes that you can identify a man and his destiny based upon how his hair looks, what kind of clothes he wears. He has no tattoos. He has no piercings. He hasn't squared off his beard. All of these things are in the law. You can spot who a man is by what he looks like and what he sounds like and what he dresses like. And Jesus says, assuredly, I say to you, Unless a man has something far better than how he cuts his hair and what kind of clothes he wears and whether or not he's tattooed and whether or not he's pierced. I'm only saying these things because they're all in the law, by the way. I'm not saying them because they're issues at the local church. Maybe they are. We're just too late if they are. Or we're in the wrong covenant if they are. Because for an Israelite, you could shave it a certain way. Not another way, a certain way. You didn't put certain things on your body. You didn't wear mixtures of clothing. And they came to where they could identify what tribe you came from, how you were raised, and what you knew about God based on externals, based on the flesh. And Jesus says, oh, you think you can spot a man who's come from God, don't you? You got to figure it out. I mean, a man like me couldn't come from, couldn't do the stuff I do unless he's come from God. Nicodemus, I'm going to teach you there's a whole new way to determine who a man is. It's not going to have anything to do with what you have known in the past. It's an entirely new way of seeing humanity. You're going to have to be born again to be able to see it this way. There's going to be something new that occurs. 
This is unique. I, I, I put up four things that you're going to notice. We're not going to jump to all of the verses right now. I posted them out there so you can look a couple of them up on your own, but we'll get to them as we work through tonight and through next week because this is really two different topics, but watch this. Number one, born again appears in no other gospel. Not Matthew, not Mark, not Luke. That's amazing. You don't have one moment where Matthew, Mark, or Luke leans to the born again theology. I'll give you my theory. I'll say it. I said it before. I'll say it once. We won't spend too much time there. I think Matthew, Mark, and Luke fall before the fall of the temple, and they're all warning Israel of a wrath to come against a system. And therefore, their thought theology of born again is not as well-rounded as Paul's will be. And then I think John borrows from that. Born again is in no other God. Born again appears only twice in John. Both of them happen in chapter 3. I think it's verses 3 and verse 7, which we'll brush tonight. Kingdom of God. Remember, unless a man's born again, he won't see the kingdom. Kingdom of God appears 82 times in the Gospels. That's a, a lot. I also parenthesis kingdom of heaven because Matthew likes kingdom of heaven. He doesn't only like kingdom of heaven. And then strangely, he's the only gospel that uses kingdom of heaven. And I'll not get into why. That's for another study. 82 times kingdom of God. And yet it appears only twice in the book of John. Now that one, that last one to me, might be more amazing than number one. Number one, born again, nowhere Matthew, Mark, or Luke. I understand that because that's a Pauline philosophy, born again. But the fourth one, 82 times, you're going to say kingdom of God and four gospels, you would think it'd be fairly well you know, distributed, say 20 or so in each gospel. Why does John only have it twice? And I want you to notice that in John's verses 3 and 5, they're connected to being born again. For John, he says, unless a man's born again, he won't enter the kingdom. And, that, and he says that the born again reality, a uh, man's born of water and born of spirit, uh, and don't marvel that I said you must be born again. And that if you're not born of the water and born of the spirit, you won't enter the kingdom. So John's doing something interesting, part of which we'll, like I say, part of which we'll really dive into when we get into the kingdom next week. But born again and kingdom closely connected and yet confined in this sense to John. I'll leave it to you for this week as to why, because I think the kingdom stuff is so deep. That's waters we might swim in for even more than a week. But I just want to kind of lay that out there. That's a little bit of my style sometime in teaching. I don't always want to run you all the way down the road. I just want to point you to the road. So I think sometimes you're safer on your own study to go, do I want to go down that road? And if you do, there's a lot of stuff down there. And it's not always easy for me to go down it because I will find seven rabbits on that trail and try to chase them all and we'll be here at like 1030. And then we walk away and we were all over the map. And so I leave that to you as why is there so little of born again in John? Why is there so little of the kingdom in John? We'll kind of expand on that, I think, as we go along a little bit. Um, Could it be that John has heard the theology of Paul. He is watching Paul expound on the new covenant like nobody else in the New Testament. Paul's doctrines of righteousness by faith, his doctrine of justification are off the charts. Nobody equals or parallels Paul. Paul was so heady that Peter ends his second epistle by, hey, pay attention to what Paul say and it's good stuff. Paul's not as much justification by faith as he is the Holy Spirit. I spent years going, Paul's number one theme is justification by faith. And then I started actually reading Paul. And I realized, yeah, sometimes that's our problem is we're hearing everybody else talk about stuff instead of actually doing our own homework. I started actually reading Paul. And I realized that Paul was obsessed with life in the Spirit. Obsessed with it. Everywhere you turn, Paul's like talking to you about the Holy Spirit, living in you, moving through you. Leading you, guiding you, directing you. Matthew, Mark, Luke, there's a little bit of the Holy Ghost. John explodes with the Holy Spirit. This Jesus of love, this powerfully passionate Christ who finds himself getting his hands dirty all the time in people's lives. It's so Pauline. I don't want to indicate, because when you do this, what happens is I think we look at Bible study through a Western lens. And when you start as a Bible, as a teacher, bringing up that an author does something to make a point, we start to walk away and go, well, didn't Jesus really say that? I mean, 
And, the, and he did, obviously. It's what John brings up. But why does John focus you so much on this Nicodemus moment, this born-again moment, and the theology of born-again that really under toes a lot of what John is doing because I think he's watched Paul and he's learned a thing or two about what Paul has to say and I don't think it's John's first moment I think that because we're going so slow through the journey it's easy to forget that John has been setting you up for this for instance look at John chapter 1 we were there weeks ago in fact months ago but look at John chapter 1 verse 12 As many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. To those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, not of the will of the flesh, not of the will of man, but of God. John has a purpose here. He has an agenda, a word you've heard me use many times with John. But who is his agenda aimed at in this moment? Who thinks that they get something because of who their daddy is or that they belong in a certain group because of their bloodline. In the time of John or Christ, who was it that felt that they had more than those other heathens because of who they could trace their lineage back to? John's not suddenly doing it in John 3. He's been setting you up since John 1 when he said, the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God and the light shine in the darkness and the light is the life of men. And as many of us as believe on his name, he gave us the authority to call ourselves the sons of God. And we were born. We were what? We were born. That's interesting. Not of blood, not of the will of man, but of God. It has nothing to do with who your daddy is or can you trace yourself back to Abraham or do you know the stories of the Torah? He said to call yourself one of the sons of God. And John's jumping the gun. Because when you're in John 1, 12, you don't have any idea. If You, you know, because you've read it a million times. But if you're reading John for the first time, how do you be, who gives you the right to say that you can become one of the sons of God simply because of, of what? We don't even know. How do you get to do that? Then comes the Nicodemus moment. And John knows what's coming in his writing. He puts Nicodemus there on purpose. I don't think Nicodemus happens this early in the life of Christ, as we said last week. Because one of the first words out of Nicodemus' mouth is, hey, nobody can do the great stuff you're doing unless he's from God. What's Jesus done? Not much. It's John 3. I mean, the really cool stuff doesn't even happen until John 5. Well, only water to wine is pretty cool, but you get my point. What's he done? Well, I don't think this is happening in real time. I think John has dragged this Nicodemus moment right up front because John wants up front to establish with his audience what he said to them in 112. That you can be one of the children of God, but it's not going to have anything to do with who your daddy is. and It's not going to have anything to do with what blood you have in your veins and and all of those things that have been so important. Because look at men, all of that stuff, those who believe in his name, they're not, we're, we're born, we're not of blood, we're not of the will of the flesh, not of the will of man, we've been born of God. All of those three things are heritage statements. You get what you get because of what you were born into. And John said there's a new way. And it looks a little bit like this. Look at John 3 again. We didn't even read this part. This is right after our Jesus moment. I just want to read through it. I want you to watch what John is trying to do. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? I used to think that was the stupidest question when I was younger. And I'd read Nicodemus. I'd go, How's he so smart? And he asked such a dumb question. He'd be born twice. I'm trying to ease up a little bit on Nicodemus because I was thinking of it through my lens. I already understood understood born again theology, you know. So how could Nicodemus be so dumb? I wasn't thinking like a Jew circa first century who thinks you get what you get because who your daddy is and your bloodline and your heritage. So for Nicodemus, it's a dumb thing for Jesus to say born again. By the way, the phrase born again in the Greek is born from above. Or and this is really, I really worked this one over in my own head. The the Greeks also the phrase for from the beginning. So it would be like saying, unless a man is born from the beginning, he doesn't get to see the kingdom. That doesn't flow off the tongue real well. 
So you can see why the translators didn't go born from above, born from the beginning. They went born again. And I think one of the reasons they used the word again was because of what Nicodemus says. Nicodemus doesn't say, how can a man be born from above? Or how can a man be uh, born from the beginning? Nicodemus says, how could a man be born when he's old? Can he go back a second time to his mom? So Nicodemus is speaking towards it being a repeat birth. Just, by, just based on his own vernacular, Nicodemus seems to think what Jesus has said is, is that you need to be born a second time. And like I say, I don't want to be hard on Nicodemus, but for a long time I thought, that's a dumb thing. Why does he ask that? No, but he can't think that's what Jesus means. But he has to think it's what Jesus means because in his mentality, there's nothing better than being born a Jew. I mean, not if you want the promises of God. We're God's chosen people. I mean, I've had it from the moment I was conceived. I, it's how I can survive in a world full of Caesars. It's how I sleep at night, knowing that, yeah, we don't have all the stuff, but we got what matters. I mean, you may win this battle, but I'm going to win the war. I mean, that's, that's palatable. That goes down smooth. And you mean to tell me that my birth isn't going to mean anything in this place you call the kingdom of God, but I got to be rebirthed. So Nicodemus then, now I can see how he ends up going, how are you going to get back in your, how are you going to get back in your mother's, because for him, his natural birthright is the greatest thing he has. So when you talk about being born again, all he can imagine is, the way it happened the first time. I've, from the moment I've been able to understand, I've been told we're the people of God. How are we going to do that again? I mean, how do we go back and get in mother's womb? And Jesus says, most assuredly I say to you, unless you're born of the water and the spirit, you can't enter the kingdom of God. There's our first key that of what born again in the, in the economy of Jesus might look like, unless a man is born of both the water and the Holy Spirit. And we've had big time theological Bible study fights in my life over what that means. Jesus means you got to be baptized as the Holy Spirit comes into you. And that if you're not baptized by water, the Holy Spirit's like, a, I, I think Jesus is simply talking about your first birth meeting your second birth. Because when you're born, the water breaks. Nicodemus gets that. And Jesus goes, look, I say unless you're born of water and the Spirit. See, the whole bragging you've been doing, Nicodemus, was a water birth. It was all you've got. You've been bragging about water birth. I say to you, a man's got to be born of the water and the Holy Spirit's going to do something in that man. He can't enter the kingdom of God. And we're going to bypass that kingdom of God phrase for this week. That which is born of, oh, look at this. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. What might Jesus be saying to Nicodemus? You have bragged about your birth, but all you're bragging about is that which is born of the flesh. I say to you that in the new kingdom, it isn't going to have anything to do with who you were born in the flesh to. It's going to have to do with being born in the Spirit. Don't marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. I'm tempted not even to read eight because, I man, I can't hardly, that verse, I love verse eight. I don't want to get stuck. The wind blows where it wishes and you hear the sound of it, but you can't tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone, and there's your phrase, born of the Spirit. Nicodemus, you were born of water. You think that matters. You are so confident that you know who's from God by natural birth that you walked up to me and said, I must be from God because you can tell, right? I've got news for you. You can't tell anything. Because all you know is natural water birth, but a man must be born of the Spirit. Don't marvel that I said to you, you must be born again, you're going to see the kingdom. Because the kingdom is something you can't even imagine. You're going to have to have a birth of the Holy Spirit to be able to understand the glories and the wonders of my Father's kingdom. And I'm saying to you folks, all of this blasted right past Nicodemus. There's just almost no way he comprehended what was going on. So much so that Matthew didn't write it down. Mark didn't write it down. And Luke didn't write it down. And here's where my theory comes full circle. I don't think they wrote it down because I don't think any of them understood it either. Mm 
just no good way to explain it. Until Saul sees a bright light on the road to Damascus. And he's introduced to Jesus. And Saul comes out of the gate a ball of fire. (laughs) Blood still on his hands from the persecution of Christians. Early book of Acts. And this guy comes out preaching and God knows what, but he's full of vigor. So much so that in the early chapters of Acts, the Bible says that the church ships him away to Tarsus and he stays gone for over a decade. He was so dangerous. The early church said, we we need him to go temper that for a little while. Well, it worked because Paul went away and he met Jesus. And Paul says, I heard these things from Christ. In other words, this is a revelation. And what does Paul come back preaching? Paul comes back preaching what we call the new covenant, what some people in the message of grace like to call the message of grace. Paul didn't call it the message of grace. Paul come back preaching Jesus, Christ and him crucified, resurrected reality, old man is dead. He comes back preaching a laundry list of stuff nobody had ever heard in the history of the world. I think it's why Matthew, Mark, and Luke can't touch Nicodemus, and I think it's why John does, because John's heard Paul preach now for a few decades. And I think one day, I'd love that moment when it happened, I think one day John has a true revelation of all the things he hears Paul preaching about grace. And he goes back in his mind's eye to a night when Nicodemus walked up to Jesus. And Jesus might as well have been speaking Chinese because he said stuff to Nicodemus that none of them got, none of them understood, because how can that work? And then through the lens of Paul's new creation teaching, John gets it. You know what, maybe what Jesus meant when he was talking to Nicodemus was this reality of being in the kingdom on the other side of a fallen temple, this reality that we're, it's not about who my daddy was or what tribe of Israel I'm from or whether or not I can quote the Torah or whether I know that I'm from Abraham. Maybe it's something greater. Maybe it's something bigger. Maybe it looks like Paul's version of rebirth. And I, it is my glory and honor to walk you through some of those. Watch this. Titus 3, for Titus chapter 3, verses 3, 4, and 5. Paul writing to his friend, For we ourselves were also once foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving various lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But when the kindness and the love of God our Savior toward man appeared, that might be the single most poetic and greatest description of Jesus in all of the New Testament. Can you go back one screen? Just because I love it so much. When the kindness and the love of God our Savior toward man appeared. Man, that's a good description. Next. Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. And that's a master's thesis sentence on John 3.3. Marvel not, Nicodemus, I say you've got to be born again. A man born of the flesh is one thing, but a man born of the Spirit, of water and the Spirit. And Paul comes along and goes, I, I can tell you what Jesus meant. <laughs> what, what, look at that regeneration. Renew. That word regeneration in the Greek is, the, is a word that literally means what it sounds like. Regened man. That you met Christ and your gene pool changed. Now, I know it doesn't literally change. We've, if you're a non-believer and they did a DNA test on you and then you became a believer and they did a DNA test on you, the DNA is the same. But Paul, metaphorically speaking to an audience of people who have been Jewish and, and proud of it their whole lives, says when you met him, he re you. You're no longer identifiable because of who your daddy was or where you were raised or how much scripture you can quote or how many lambs you kill. Because you've received the mighty washing power of the Holy Spirit, you've been regenerated. Or how he says it to the Galatian church. Galatians 6.15 For in Christ Jesus, your circumcision and your uncircumcision doesn't matter, but a new creation. There's another... Masters, there's another doctoral thesis line built off of John 3. That's Jesus talking to Nicodemus, but it's Paul talking to Galatia. Nobody ever thought to write this stuff down because nobody ever saw this stuff. This is mind blowing. This is path breaking. I mean, it doesn't matter if you're circumcised or you're not circumcised. None of that matters except being a new creation. Look at Ephesians 4 22. Put off 
concerning your former conduct, the old man, which grows corrupt according to deceitful lusts. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new man, which was not fashioned by your actions or birthed by your heritage, but was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. So Paul says there's some things you need to stop. I'm not going to try to preach Paul's theology here. I get too sidetracked getting too deep into these verses, but put off what you used to do. Put on who you are. Why? Because the who you are isn't, you didn't fashion it. It's who he made you to be. You're created in his likeness image. Colossians 3, 9. Don't lie to one another. Why? Because the old covenant says thou shalt not lie. (laughs) No, don't lie to one another because you've put off the old man with his deeds and you've put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. And then he goes too far. He goes too far for his audience. Where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised nor uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free. But Christ is all in all. What does Paul do? He builds off of Jesus' statement to Nicodemus. Oh, you think you can identify a good man by what he does, don't you? But I say to you, unless a man's born all over again, he's not going to see the kingdom. What kind of birth? No, not the flesh. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. But that which is born of the spirit, Nicodemus, that spirit, that's the real deal citizens of the kingdom. What do they look like? Jesus doesn't bother to get too deep into that. He can't yet. He's not died on the cross and rose from the dead and poured out the Holy Spirit. There's only going to be so much description he can give you in John 3. And then Paul comes along in full technicolor and says, here's what it looks like. Or how about this one? 2 Corinthians 5.16. Therefore, from now on, we don't regard anyone according to their flesh. That ought to have a new meaning for you now after you've been hearing what Jesus says to Nicodemus. We don't regard anybody according to their flesh. Even though we knew Christ according to the flesh, yet now we don't know him that way any longer. Therefore, if any man is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And every time we teach this in the the church, we say what Jesus meant was, or what Paul means is, when you get saved, all your old stuff's gone, all your new stuff's new. But that's not what he meant to his audience. He said, we don't regard people according to the flesh anymore. Man's in Christ, he's been born again. And all the old identifying marks of who he was in God are gone. His old identifying marks was his circumcision and who his daddy was and his heritage and his Passover and his law keeping and his temple attendance and his tithe paying. But all that stuff's passed away. Why? Because you're not an old birth anymore. You're a new birth, you're a new creation. Peter even gets into the game a little bit. Peter's not got quite the depth Paul has, but I'm going to give you his one shot at it. By the way, here's the only other place in the New Testament with the phrase born again. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 22, 23, since you've purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit in sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart, having been born again, not of a corruptible seed, but incorruptible. Through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. That phrase, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, was Peter's way of saying, what you have, you didn't get because of who your natural daddy was. What you, and by the way, this is definitely to a Jewish audience because 1 Peter chapter 1 starts out by saying, I write unto you members of the dispersion. Dispersion are Jews scattered throughout the Roman Empire. That's Peter's way of saying, I say to you, you've been bragging about who your daddy was your whole life. None of it matters anymore because you're not born of corruptible seed. You've been born of incorruptible seed. You've been born again. I like it that it's Peter that uses born again. Seems fair. He heard Jesus say it the first time. I don't think he understood it. But it, when he first heard it, by the time he pens it in First Peter, he's getting there. It's not quite Pauline, but it's good. And Paul's theology rounds that born again experience out. Let me go back and put a cap on something I said earlier. I'm trying to wind, wind to a glass. I, I feel like I've went a long time tonight. Uh, I told you earlier, maybe it's not as much about walking the aisle and a born again experience. I don't want to. 
I don't want to poo-poo that <laughs> idea theologically because I believe very much in believing on who he is. And as John 3 un, sort of unvelops, de, develops or uh, sort of exposes its theology to us, what we will find is that Jesus does say that whoever believes in him should not perish but have life. That leads into that famous 16th verse, you know, God's soul of the world. But for Jesus, and, and I think even for the early church, it wasn't as much about the experience. It was about simple faith. It might be as simple as me saying to you, can you believe what I tell you? You say, I can believe that. And as I get the early church, that was their starting block of salvation. We make it into this event. Sometimes I wonder if we don't do that for us as much as we do it for the person. I mean, haven't been brought up in church and pastor's homes and then pastored for a long time. And I've preached all over the world and tried to get people to come forward and say prayers. And I, I started to realize that for a lot of it was, it was for my own assurance that we had done something right more than it was for their assurance. Because I think a lot of times I left church, quite frankly, not caring whether or not they got it or not. I had the tally mark. They said the prayer. And that works for something, you know. Now we can say X amount of commitments. <laughs> I don't know if anything happened to them. Maybe it wasn't supposed to happen to them. Maybe it was way more important that I talk to them and that I show them Jesus until maybe they believe in him. Maybe that doesn't happen in a Sunday go to meeting. Maybe that doesn't happen saying a prayer at the end of just as I am. Maybe that happens over two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, five weeks, six months, a year. Maybe we rushed the process because we had a mistaken idea about what we were supposed to be doing with sinners. Like save them as fast as possible, lest they die. And maybe we missed it. Maybe it wasn't about saving them lest they die. Maybe it was about seeing them saved because they're already dead. And we need life poured into them. And sometimes that takes time. I don't really see John 3, 3 as... The, the underpinnings of the born-again experience gospel that I used to. I see John 3, 3 as Jesus' first introduction to a Jewish world. There's a world coming. And the centerpiece of it won't have anything to do with whether you can identify who your daddy was, what your sacred text is, or what land you came from. I'm going to introduce you to a kingdom where it's not going to matter if you're circumcised or uncircumcised. It's not going to matter if you're a Jew or a Gentile, a man or a woman, a slave, or free. It's only going to matter that you've believed on me and then the Holy Spirit's going to do the rest. And I don't tell him how to work and I don't tell him how fast to work. He's like the wind. He blows where he wants to. And I'm okay with that. That's a born-again theology that to me underpins the rest of the New Testament. And it sets Paul up. And maybe, in my theory, it's the other way around. Paul sets John 3 up. But chronologically, if you're reading it left to right, it sets you up for a man named Paul and his gospel. Let's go back one more shot. John 3, 3, 4, 5. Here's where we will be next week. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said, how can man be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time with his mother's womb? Be born. Jesus answered, most assuredly, I say to you, unless you're born of water and of spirit, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. Look at the end of verse 3. You can't see the kingdom. Look at the end of verse 5. You can't enter the kingdom. We, We cannot leave this passage without dealing with the only two times in his gospel John introduces you to the kingdom of God. And it's my one shot in the entire gospel to preach the kingdom. (laughs) And so there's no way we can miss that opportunity because if you think, if you think I took it tonight to Paul, like, wow, you got to leave John three and go get Paul to really understand this. Wait till next week. (laughs) You go to Paul to understand the kingdom And you go into some of the other gospel writers to understand the kingdom, particularly Matthew, who's like a thesis on the kingdom of God, to really understand what's going on here. And we will get into what the kingdom looks like. And spoiler alert, I don't think Jesus is talking about going to heaven when you die. I don't mean there's not a heaven when you die, but I don't think that's what he's talking about. 
Nicodemus did not come to Jesus looking for a way to get to a place after he was dead. Nicodemus came to find out what this place was Jesus kept talking about. And we're going to start talking about it with him next week. Father, I thank you for the word tonight, and I thank you for this audience, and I thank you for the power that is found in them. Exploring Jesus and the wonderful things about Jesus. And I pray that it goes forth seed into good ground in Jesus' name. Amen.